two households alike in dignity in Verona, where we set our play. I'm sure I'm paraphrasing, but that's okay, Sue, because I'm sure you know exactly what play we're talking about. This is Jay Michaels. I'm here with Rodney Hakim, and this is the fourth folio. We examine each Shakespeare play from different angles with different guests to formulate uh, what the play was about, what Shakespeare was thinking at that time. And if you know me and, and my authorship question proclivities, <laughs> want to know exactly who may have written it. Uh, Romeo and Juliet is very special to me and the Genesis Repertory Ensemble. Genesis Repertory is 22 years old this year. We begin our 22nd year. And Romeo and Juliet was probably even more than Hamlet, which I used to think was our signature play, Romeo and Juliet is our signature play. We did it three times. We said it once. Uh, what we do, we take, we took the, uh, the original text and then we changed the location. The first time we did it, we did it in a Jerry Springer style trailer park. The second time and the third time, we did it uh, where Romeo was Jewish and Juliet was Palestinian. The first time we did that, we had it in, set in Israel and it was spoken in Arabic. It was spoken in Hebrew, in Yiddish, and obviously in Old English. And then we did it a third time and we set it in Brooklyn, utilizing the same production scheme, just giving it that more, as we say in Yiddish, that Hamish feel. Uh, <laughs> we also had a play, uh, a series called Arias and Sonnets. Rodney, I'm not sure if you were part of Arias and Sonnets when we- I don't recall that it. one, it was before my time. Okay, well, it's actually during your time, but it was all music, it was all, it was all musical works. And what we would do is find the other versions of Shakespeare's works. Uh, we would find the various operas and the various musicalizations. And we did a whole program of Romeo and Juliet where we did a scene from the Bellini opera, from the Gounod opera, and of course, from West Side Story. And yesterday, for those of you who know the cult uh, studio trauma, trauma Entertainment, I spoke with Lloyd Kaufman about his version called Tromeo and Juliet, which is this, it's like John Waters on acid, wild version that was said to be one of the three most influential film versions of Romeo and Juliet with Bellini and Lerman. So I was thrilled to speak to him and I'm thrilled with our guests that we have here to chat about Romeo and Juliet and all that goes with it. But I'm now going to be quiet. Um, I'm the kook and now I'm going to turn it over to, to the smart one. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled again to work with Rodney Hakim. As I've inferred, Rodney was part of the fourth folio when we did it as a stage work through Genesis Repertory many years ago. And, and his acumen in the subject and his, his, uh, uh, his ease and his brilliance in discussing and researching uh, Shakespeare and his plays, whoever wrote them, uh, has, has always been a sense of great learning for me. And as I mentioned to our guests before I pressed record, uh, it seems if you do Shakespeare in New York, then you know New York Shakespeare, uh, <laughs> which is Rodney Hakim's uh, program on IGTV. So I'm turning it over to, to Professor Rodney Hakim. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Thank you. You are too kind. And uh, absolutely, the work we did together with, uh, with your group, with Genesis Repertory Ensemble, on the fourth folio series when we did it theatrically uh, many years ago is one of my fondest memories through my, my many journeys through the New York Shakespeare scene. So absolutely, that definitely stands out. It's, it's, uh, for those who might not be aware, who are new to the series, who haven't seen any of our previous episodes, uh, this was a series we did uh, in the theaters of New York City many years ago, and we did the, uh, we went through the entire Shakespeare canon, in addition to many apocryphal works, and we uh, explored the play, we had talkbacks with the audience afterwards, and uh, one of the uh, main questions was uh, who we thought might have written those plays. Uh, it, it, we embraced the Shakespeare authorship issue, and we also asked about the merits of each play, some of the challenges presented by each play, and, and many other uh, uh, really great questions uh, were posed uh, throughout those readings. Uh, and now, uh, all these years later, in the uh, era of Zoom, we have brought that series back to life in this digital format where we ask 
members of the New York Shakespeare scene, of the international Shakespeare scene in many cases, to join us in this investigation. So tonight we are thrilled Our, our artistic to... director, just uh, our artistic director, by the way, sends her regards, Mary Elizabeth McCary. Uh, oh. uh, this was, she created the production scheme for Romeo and Juliet. And when I said that we were doing it tonight, she, uh, her heart went out and she said, please, we wish them all luck in talking about it. It's one of her favorite pieces. And so, and, and she sends a big kiss to you, Rodney. Thank you. Mary is fantastic. I have wonderful memories of uh, Mary. Uh, but again, uh, as Jay mentioned, uh, my name is Rodney Hakim, and I am the, uh, the voice behind the New York Shakespeare social media outlets. Uh, and our mission is to try to capture as much of we can as what's going on in the, in the scene uh, of Shakespeare in New York and in the surrounding areas. And we do that on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, WordPress, LinkedIn, and pretty much uh, any kind of social media you can think of. Uh, so we try to bring you news about theatrical performances, book readings, film screenings, uh, casting calls, uh, uh, academic discussions, uh, whatever we can get our hands on. And we try to bring that all to you. And, and this is one of my favorite uh, aspects of the New York Shakespeare uh, series is that we, we have this fourth folio uh, program and it's been so much fun to reconnect with uh, my, my dear colleague Jay and to chat with so many wonderful and talented guests, three of whom we have with us here tonight. Now, excuse me, these are all people whom I have uh, previously interviewed for another series that's the, uh, the, the original uh, series from the New York Shakespeare and that is the New York Shakespeare Live uh, interview series which is done on Instagram and rebroadcast on our other social media outlets uh, in which we interview the makers and movers in the New York Shakespeare scene and we ask them about their current projects and uh, their history with Shakespeare and we've had uh, these all three of the wonderful guests that we have tonight as well as Jay uh, on our program and chatted with them. Uh, so with no further ado, I'll introduce you to our three uh, contributors for tonight's discussion. Uh, the first is my, my dear friend, David Serrero. David, uh, I met him actually uh, in the production that we're, of his that we're gonna be talking about tonight. And that was when he did his variation of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Jay, you spoke about yours uh, where you conflated uh, the Romeo and Juliet story with the uh, Jewish versus Palestinian, with the Arab versus Jewish and some of those other uh, longstanding uh, ethnic conflicts, uh, but David uh, took a, a little bit of a different path. He transposed the Montagues and Capulets into Sephardic versus Ashkenazi Jews uh, in a very, very popular production that was uh, beyond standing room only. I, I remember being at the uh, theater that it was being done in, and there, were, there was a line out of the door of people at the, at, that were on the waiting list that just were demanding to see this show. Uh, so David, it is a, a pleasure and a privilege to have you join us tonight. How are you tonight, sir? Uh, very good, my dear Rodney. Thank you so much. It's, the honor is actually mine, and and thank you for uh, this beautiful introduction. When I pass away, as late as possible, I want you to write my eulogy. Okay? <laughs> uh, please do it. You, I know you will write it better than nobody else. Uh, thank you, you Rodney. Kind, I appreciate you that. Kind. You know. And and David, before I go any further, I should mention that. Uh, you are one of the nominees for, uh, we recently, at the, at the end of 2020, at the beginning of 2021, we published uh, on our social media channels our New York Shakespeare Awards, where we recognized some of the, uh, the, the premier uh, presentations that were offered in 2020, and David's uh, adaptations were amongst our list. So he's a nominee for us, but beyond that, he recently uh, had a couple of very big uh, announcements. He, uh, just this week, uh, was uh, recognized by Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York City for all of his uh, many, many contributions to the New York cultural scene. Ah, so okay. congratulations on that, David. Thank you so much, Rodney. I appreciate that. Thank you. And but, but what is beautiful in it is that the, the mayor of New York recognized the uh, modest immigrant as myself and who is bringing the you know, taking classics and making them, you know, sometimes with a little touch of Jewishness, sometimes more broad, sometimes with comedy, with a modern touch. So that was for me a big, uh, a big accomplishment. Hopefully I'm going to get my green card with this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dave, now, Dave now I'm putting the face to the name. Uh, I remember <laughs> seeing that on the uh, on, on your social media, Rodney, and I was like, wow, that's terrific. Good for him. Right. And now Thank I'm meeting you. you. I'm absolutely thrilled. And Thank this production of his, uh, it, just recently, he David won three, not just one, not just two, but three uh, Broadway World Decade Awards. Uh, what were the three awards you won from Broadway World, David? 
Well, uh, well, so one one's is actually for best producer of the play, which was for that Romeo and Juliet. So I'm I'm very happy. And that was not just for the year; it was for the decade. Yeah, well, you know, the decade. I mean, I don't think people remember the show they saw in 2011. You know what I mean? <laughs> so they <laughs> it, mo mostly most of the shows that were in competition were the ones done the last two, three years, you know, that, that was mostly of that. Even though I recall seeing a, a production 2012, 2013. But anyway, so it was mostly what was fresh in people's mind. And uh, uh, what, were anyway, the, what were the other ones? Happy. What were the other two? Don't worry, I, I advertised it very well. So, <laughs> Pro so produ was, producer of a show for the decade. And what were the other, I think, performer of the decade. Is that right? Yes. And also um, producer of a musical for the, the musical I've done against All Alts, uh, the musical about Anne Frank, you know. And that was Anne Frank, the musical. And that, yeah, that's quite a feat. like, what? A musical about Anne Frank? Are you out of your mind? But actually, what people didn't know is that it was like an opera. It was very emotive with the cello going with very, and that, very beautiful. And then you can go on YouTube, you can watch many excerpts and... Um, and it was a very popular show already in France, which I brought to, to New York and uh, was adapted in English. So I knew the composer who is a Sephardi Jew, ironically. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was, you know, crazy. Like talking about the line outside, I have photos like around the block, people were crazy about it. And it was, wow. and actually we, I was bring, bringing it again from was playing from March to originally July with extension to uh, October at the wow. Actors Temple in New mm -hmm. York. But, you know, with COVID, I had to close the show two right. hours before the premiere. Wow. Wow. Two wow. hours before the premiere. But and this, to you know, this, this day, my, my Starbucks cup is still on the table <laughs> at the theater because we thought it was closed for the weekend. You know, then after it was like two weeks and it's going to be like a year that the Starbucks hot chocolate thing is still over there. But I'm pretty I don't sure think it's, it's I don't think it's hot anymore before. at this point. But, but yeah. David, so, so we're, we're honored to have you and congratulations Thank on all you, of the, uh, the, you, the many accolades you have. Uh, our other two guests tonight uh, are working together uh, for the recent project. The first uh, we'll speak with is Emily Gallagher of the Barefoot Shakespeare Company. Uh, and Barefoot Shakespeare, for those who are not familiar, has been producing Shakespeare in New York City for about eight years now. Uh, they primarily work in the summers uh, at Summit Rock, and they've been presenting outdoor presentations of, of Shakespeare. I think, I think it's twice per summer. Is that right, Emily? Yes. Thank you so much, Rodney. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, yeah, we do two shows, two shows a summer. Two shows a summer. And most recently, you've been working with our other friend, uh, Melissa Bell, on her version of, or her prologue to, or her prequel to uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet entitled Lady Capulet. And you've had a couple of presentations of that in the last several months. Yes, so we actually were able to do Lady Capulet outside at Summit Rock in the summer of 2019, which is weird to say, because it really doesn't feel like it was that long ago, although it feels like it's forever ago. Um, and then we were able to move virtually, which has been really fun and exciting. And the cast from the park came to do it with us virtually. So it's been a different exploration of the text and the characters. And we get, we're kind of getting a more intimate feel for everyone, for each of these characters and who they are. And because this cast helped cre create the feel of these characters. They were the originating cast in the park, at least. Um, we're, we're just having so much fun kind of diving in a little bit deeper. And on this virtual platform, there there's different things you get to do. You know, there's benefits to both, I think. And it's been fun to see what we're able to do on this. We're about to take an, a next step with the, with the production, actually, and record a few of the Zoom productions of it and edit it a little bit, give it a little bit of production value, take it a step further than what we've done so far. That's very exciting. Now let's speak with the, the woman behind the play. Uh, that's Melissa Bell, and she is the playwright behind Lady Capulet. Melissa, when did you write this, uh, this fantastic play? I think I started in 2016, started uh, with some prompts from a playwriting group that I work with. 
and I had already decided on the characters. And so I took each prompt and, and wrote a scene. And all of a sudden I had like five scenes. I had about 50 pages and I said, well, I need to finish this. But <laughs> the idea really came from a review of Romeo and Juliet, which was down at the classic stage uh, company. And in it, Ben Brantley um, asked why did Lady Capulet cry so much at Tybalt's death? And there was sort of an insinuation there of a love interest of some sort. And I thought about, and he sort of challenged future playwrights to muse upon this and what might that be? And I felt, well, for a feud this deep, it has to be more than uh, you know an affair to me, which is kind of, simple. Uh, it has to be really deep. It has to be blood uh, for this kind of a of deep feud that Romeo and Juliet really is. Um, and so that's what we're exploring. We're exploring what caused the feud. There's a lot of parallels to Romeo and Juliet. And in fact, the play catches up with Romeo and Juliet. Um, right. It starts yeah. with the previous generation and yeah. uh, a, a very scandalous uh, incident that happens between uh, some of the members of the different families, which I won't go into detail. They have to watch the show to see what that scandal is all about. Uh, but then that's fast forward to the next generation and it picks up with Romeo and Juliet later on. Yeah. And it's, it's a really, really fun work. It's a, there's some uh, colloquial text that's kind of more contemporary, but then it kind of goes back into something that sounds more like Shakespearean verse. So it's a, it's a really nice uh, back and forth between past and present, uh, between uh, verse and prose. Uh, very, 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 uh, really nice work, Melissa. So we're happy to have you all, uh, all of our wonderful contributors tonight. Uh, so before we uh, go much further, uh, I should mention that the reason that we are doing Romeo and Juliet now is that we're just a few days removed, a few days away from Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is right around the corner. It's coming up this Monday, February 14th. And uh, if anyone, if, if anyone uh, asks you, what is the most romantic play in Shakespeare? What is the, the, <laughs> the play that, that speaks most about love and true love? Nine times out of 10, I would, guess that people are going to say it's Romeo and Juliet, wouldn't you? For sure. It's, it's in most cases, it's the play that, that people are introduced to for the first time in school, in middle school, or maybe in early high school. Uh, so it's, it's definitely, uh, it's, it's all about young love and it's all about uh, the, the, uh, the teenagers who are defying the boundaries with the parents. Uh, why don't, Emily, would you want to give us, for anyone who might not be uh, completely familiar with uh, Romeo and Juliet, could you give us a quick summary of what the play is all about? Absolutely, Rodney. I would assume most people know this show pretty well, but I'll give it a quick one. So there are two feuding families in Verona, the Montagues and the Capulets. We don't know why they're feuding, but it's been going on for years. Top of the play, they're fighting in the streets. The prince says, no way, one more fight, and that's it. You're all dead. The Capulets are throwing a, a ball. The, Montague, the young Montagues, Romeo, who is the son of Montague, is in love with one of the Capulet cousins. Her name's Rosaline. So they go to the ball, he and his cohorts all masked up and he's going there for Rosalind, but he sees Juliet. They fall in love in, in an instant, uh, realize who each other are, that they are feuding family enemies and that they cannot be together. They have a very romantic scene of expressing their love to each other, the balcony scene, We've all, we all know that one. And uh, then unfortunately, during this happiness, um, Romeo and his buddies are out in the streets of Verona again, and Tybalt, who is Juliet's cousin, comes out into the streets as well. He is not happy. He hates the Montagues. He starts a fight with Mercutio, who kind of, Mercutio kind of gets to go between both families. Um, he's, he is part of the Montague clan, but the, he's friends with the Capulets as well. He's friends with the prince. Um, and so, unfortunately, Tybalt ends up killing Mercutio and then Romeo gets upset and he kills Tybalt and it's horrible. And then Juliet finds out that the man she is in love with and betrothed to has just killed her cousin. They sneak to Friar Lawrence and he weds them secretly. They have a night of passion and then Romeo is banished and has to leave. Friar Lawrence comes up with this brilliant plan so that Juliet doesn't have to marry the horrible Paris who her father is trying to push her off to. 
And Fire Lawrence comes up with this plan that, okay, we're gonna have Juliet fake her death. We're gonna stick her in a tomb. Oh guys, spoiler alerts, by the way. <laughs> then, we're gonna send, then we're gonna send a note to Romeo. And we're gonna tell him, this is what's up, come to her tomb and we'll sneak you away and you'll get to live forever in happiness. Well, unfortunately, the friar who's supposed to bring, the messenger who's supposed to bring uh, Romeo the note, they cross paths, they never, he never gets the note. Romeo gets to the, here's Juliet is dead, gets to the tomb, sees what he thinks is a dead Juliet in front of him, cannot stand it. He is too in love with her to live without her. And so he kills himself. He drinks poison and he kills himself. And Juliet wakes right up right after that and realizes, oh my gosh, everything went wrong. This is horrible and feels the same way. I cannot live where he is, where this man is not. And he is dead, so I must, be, I must die as well. There's no poison left for her. So she takes his dagger and she stabs herself. And that is the, that is the end of the play. Actually, That's the happy <laughs> ending of the <laughs> What? Oh no, I'm not gonna see it now, now that I know what happened. <laughs> I, I will actually backtrack for a second and say the true ending is the prince coming in and saying, okay, this has to stop. The feuding has to end. Look at what your hatred did. Your hatred killed your children. And the Montagues and the Capulets do agree to, be, to move peacefully forward. Does that happen? We don't know, but there is a moment where they agree this was not okay. And that they're gonna build statues to their children um, as a, public stance of we are okay we're not feuding anymore so this this uh, thank you that that was a great summary uh, emily so this is a play that was written in around 50 somewhere between 1591 and 1596 depending who you ask or what source you reference why is a play that's over 400 years old why does it still have so much relevance today why is in anything right now in the contemporary New York, the year 2021, if you have any kind of young love that is tragically halted, it is considered a Romeo and Juliet story. What about this story has transcended the ages and crossed over from Shakespeare's day 400 plus years ago and makes it still so relevant today? Melissa, what, what about it grabbed you? What about it? You I think were, it's you the were... themes. It's definitely the themes of um, of, of the sins of the father being visited upon the children. Um, it is the theme of that consequences of, of hatred, that hatred um, kills the things that you love the most. And, um, and that, there's, that there are consequences to, to your actions. And, um, and I think, and then the hopefulness of the, of the love itself, the fact that we think that we can meet someone and really have a true connection with them. Um, tragedies, you know, I don't know. And I think the fact that it goes, that they decide to be together even in death, there's a certain, certainly a certain appeal to that, you know, that Absolutely. He, I would, I would follow that person, you know. Absolutely. But, you know, I, I think what I was, what I was mentioning before that even it's even taught in middle school. And it's, I, I think the, re, there's a reason that this is the, our introduction to teenagers and adolescents and people who are just uh, understanding, just butting into their sexuality is that there, that, that desire, that, that young impudent love that that rash desire that you have when you're a teenager and and who cares what mom and dad said I'm in love and this is going to last forever and this is this is the one and there's something about that that's so universal and, and it, uh, it Jay would you would you agree that this is something that that from when we're our, our, our uh, sexual identities awakened this is something that that connects to everyone whether you're you know male or female, gay or straight, whatever the, whatever nationality, whatever ethnicity, there is that young love that's so difficult to deny. And there has to be some, some expression of it, some reference point to it in culture that we can understand or we can look to, 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 ref, to mirror our own experience. I think that's why we, we, the way I'm putting it is wrong, but we love the fact they die. Because <laughs> when, when you are so young and, and, and love hits you, however it hits you, whether it's sexually, emotionally, et cetera, there is nothing stronger. Uh, we all remember our first. 
because it's just this explosion within us. And, and uh, so to hear that they died for this, and of course, these are two young people. They're, they're, if you go by, by the standards of the time, they're 13 or 14 years old. Uh, so, so we're able to feel that. I'm sorry? I, well, she is, she is under, she's not yet 14, but I would, he could be older. I think Romeo is a little older. It doesn't, doesn't say specifically in the text. But he maybe might be, he might be 16. I can't imagine too much older. Uh, no. I've always felt that Shakespeare, whoever he is, uh, uh, was very clairvoyant on something. And I bring up Merchant of Venice. I bring up so many different pieces, Othello and whatever, on a certain clairvoyancy. And I'm wondering if he didn't do it here. He was, and, and you made a point of saying this, Emily, it, we don't know uh, why they're fighting. Uh, we have absolutely no idea. We just know that they don't like each other. And when you get down to it, that's bigotry. Oh, I don't like, I don't like them because they, they are different. Well, how my parents said that they're different. And, and I'm wondering if, if Romeo and Juliet, part of the reason we grab hold of it uh, is because it's a parable of bigotry. Uh, it's, uh, we don't know why. So uh, are, the, are the Montagues and the Capulets different fates? Are they different anything? And do we feel, uh, what's the best way to put it? Do we feel like, like uh, uh, do we feel that racial tension, if you will? When, when, when he steps back in, I, I, I'm definitely gonna ask David because he, he's sort of hitting it there. Um, but I asked- it, it could be anything, it could be tribes, Exactly. It could be ethnicity. It can be racial. Um, yeah, just or just you know Hatfield and McCoy's kind of thing where that's people actually, can't stand them. That's how Tibble we did our production in, in 2014. We did we did Hatfields versus McCoy's. That was a, our concept. That was Tibble, Tibble Tibble so Shakespeare, hates, Romeo and Juliet. Yes. Tybalt so hates his his enemies there without any, you know, you think he is a wonderful character that could be more articulate and say, I hate them because, and there's nothing. So so I get a very racial feeling. And I think all of us, uh, because yes, that's why we see it in high school and middle school, because because we're at that point where we're exploding in love. And so they were, oh, let's die for each other. But you know, as, we, uh, as we get older, that's what we say, black, white, Jewish, Catholic, Protestants, uh, uh, Catholic. That's where we start seeing that. I'm this this raises that a very interesting question, Jay, because uh, right now in contemporary times, it's it's the norm that the lovers choose each other, and you you choose your spouse, you choose your lover uh, based on your own interests, your own preferences. It wasn't necessarily the case in Shakespeare's day, right. and you'll see that with uh, with. Uh, Juliet's uh, family where they they have someone they've selected for her and he's the he's the prince he's the wealthy one and you're going to marry him because this is what we tell you to do and if you extrapolate that to past even uh, this was written in the 1590s and it was based on source material that was from the 1560s and uh, thereabouts but the same story exists from many many centuries before from even the 7th century AD uh, this tale, this is an, a Western story. This is written in England in the 15, uh, late 1500s. The same story exists in the seventh century in the East, in uh, the Arabic lands. And, and there's the story that, that many consider the Arabic precursor to Romeo and Juliet called the Lely and Majnun story. For those who might not be familiar with it, it's, uh, it's, it's just that thing. It's the, that there's two people from different castes, from dis different families who fall in love with each other. And the, they want to marry, but the parents strictly forbid it, and they remove them from each other. They, they forbid them to ever see each other again, to speak to each other again. And the one character, the male character, his name is uh, Raiz uh, in the beginning, but he goes so crazy from his uh, inability to connect with his love, uh, with, with Leili, his love that he becomes, he takes on the persona, the, the new identity of Majnun. And Majnun, for those who don't speak either Arabic or uh, it later uh, went to Iran, it went to uh, India, it went to some of those neighboring areas. Majnun is uh, colloquialism for crazy. It's like what, what uh, in Yiddish you call Meshugana. It's, it's like uh, Majnun. He's, uh, he, he's gone crazy from love. So I think you, this, this, it's not just that uh, it's limited to Shakespeare's day. I think this is an archetype of young lovers who 
for centuries, for millennia, have loved each other, but were not allowed because of social strictures, because of the societal norms, and because of what the parents who, uh, until just recent times, were in charge, they, they didn't allow it. So how did they, how did we, we, we get back to the current day, or at least the, I'm sorry, the day of, of Shakespeare when he's writing this story, you have the very powerful family, the Capulets, who are the from one side of town. And I, in my estimation, it seems like the Capulets are a, a little bit on a higher societal level than the Montagues. W would you uh, agree with that, Emily? Yeah, I think based on just what we see from, we see much more of the Capulets than we do the Montagues. So I, it could just be perspective, but we see the prince at the Capulets ball and that he, the prince is part of working with um, the Capulets to get Juliet and Paris together and all of these things. So the prince is very more clearly involved with the Capulets from what we see in this text. We do see a lot more of them, so it could just be that. But yeah, I think that it feels like there's a slightly higher status there. It, it seems just from the fact that they, they're connected to uh, the prince, that they have you know, such, a, such a desirable marriage prospect in Paris that who's so wealthy and who's coming for their daughter and he, it, it just seems like it just seems like a case where it's it's uh, the almost like uh, if you transpose it to the Disney version of it with uh, if you if you look at it, it's almost like uh, Princess Jasmine and uh, Prince Ali, Prince Aladdin, you know that same kind of thing where she's the 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 king's daughter uh, or the whatever the, the sultan I don't remember what the characterization is there, sultan. and he's the street the street rat, you know it's almost the same kind of thing, and I think they even reference uh, they call. Tybalt, the king of rats, right? Rat catcher. Yeah. Rat, catcher. Rat, catcher. rat catcher. He's the king, king of cats. King, but... king, of, king of cats, right. It's, yeah. it's there's, interesting there's that also, Emily, what you, uh, and we're talking about uh, their, their social status because, uh, okay, yes, they've arranged a marriage for Juliet. Now, if Romeo is a bit older, where is his wife? Why haven't the Montagues arranged? Why is he out looking at Rosaline and everything like that? if he's of any stature. I, I, I want to grab well, David, well, actually. Man. Uh, okay, yeah. On a, on a particular thing. Um, uh, and also, just, just point of trivia, if you look at Midsummer Night's Dream, the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, again, yes. it's Romeo and Juliet with comedy. If you look at the musical The Fantastics, it's Romeo and Juliet with, with comedy in a wall. Uh, uh, now, if we're looking at it in terms of a racial thing, David, now, you, you picked, they're all Jewish, but they're uh, Sephardic and Ashkenazi. Now, now there's, and I'm, I'm really impressed because uh, yes, I'm sure if you speak to someone who's Sephardic, they're gonna say they are so different from Ashkenazi and vice versa. I worked for a Sephardic organization for years and I'm Ashkenazi and Lord knows. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, and Lord knows I spoke Yiddish, so it was like I was cursed, um, but, uh, uh, did you address it in terms of a racial thing or, or religious or a cultural thing in terms of here? It's the same people. Hello, we're both well, I, I addressed it in uh, only in terms of culture. That was, that was the idea. And it always has been, you know. Um, it's only in America, with all due respect, that, uh, you know, we see the people, different colors, different, you know, like the whites here, the blacks here, the black culture, the white culture. I, I never heard this stuff before, you know? So it always has been for me a question of culture. And what I wanted with Romeo and Juliet is, because as you uh, said, EJ, is that in America, there is a lot of the Ashkenazi uh, tradition. The Jews, most of the Jews, I don't have the exact number, but most of the Jews, that you can find in, um, in, in America or Ashkenazi, but you have all this Sephardic culture, which is not very known uh, in America. And yet now in France, in Europe, or we see mostly uh, Sephardic Jews. So I wanted to show uh, that uh, culture and, uh, and to show I'll, you- I'll just ask you to pause for a second, David. I'll just ask you to pause for a second. For, for anyone who's listening who doesn't know what we're talking about, uh, Ashkenazi Jews are mostly Western European and uh, Sephardic Jews are mostly Middle Eastern and North African. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And the Ashkenazi Middle Eastern Jews European. are the ones who have the best credit. Yeah, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, you know, Ashkenazi Jews, they have credit score 920. That's a bad credit score for them, you know. 
you know, Ashkenazi, we're happy when we have 400 as a credit, <laughs> you know what I mean? Anyway. So it's the old world <laughs> Jewish. When you hear about the immigrants coming over from, from Eastern Europe and all of that, uh, that's Ashkenazi. When, when you hear about yeah, and, uh, coming from Israel in the Middle East, that's usually Sephardic. Right. Their contribution right. to um, the American cultural landscape is enormous. Like, you know, from that start, from the Yiddish theater, started the Marx Brothers, then started, you know, all the comedy uh, to Jerry Seinfeld, to whatever we see, you know, the funny stuff we see on Netflix, you know, it also comes from that. Yes. Uh, in a way, it's in the direct uh, avenue, I would say. Uh, I miss, can, can you believe there used to be, I, I think, 18 or 20 uh, Yiddish theater in Second Avenue? Can, can you yeah, believe back that? in the day. But uh, Dave, did, did you... Do you find that when you go back and forth, you're, you're of French Moroccan uh, descent. When you go back to those, those areas, do you find that uh, there's any difference, any that the, the Ashkenazim look at the Jew, uh, the, the Sephardic Jews in a certain way or vice versa, or everyone's no, the same? Not anymore. They used to be, you know, in the old days, even when you came from the city of Morocco, uh, people were, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I was going to say fighting with the people who were coming from another city. You know, it's like in rap music in the U.S. East Coast, West, West Coast thing. You know, right. the fighting amongst themselves. Yeah, yeah, but n not anymore. It's kind of a very the old days, and and I think it's better. You know, everybody is like now as one, and thanks to the great peace accord that there is that there has been recently, um, that gap would happen even less because now in Morocco. Israelis would be able to 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 come, so um, there would be direct likes. But anyway, it's another subject. Um, no, um, for me it was a cultural. This is why I had the Ashkenazi side of uh, Romeo and Juliet um, singing Yiddish songs, you know, and the Sephardic side singing uh, Ladino and Sephardic stuff and. Uh, right. And at the, at the ball, at the beginning, when Romeo means Juliet, there was a tumba la laika, a Yiddish thing. And then I started to have a guy doing some um, tap dancing in the middle of it, and turning up jazz. And, and we started to go like wet side story. And then a reviewer, a journalist who came, and I didn't even think about it, said, oh, you wanted to pay a tribute to the Romeo and Juliet West Side Story, which was done by two Ashkenazi, um, three Ashkenazi as well as like the Leonardo, Five Ashkenazi. Uh, Stephen Sondheim and the third, I forgot, the choreographer. Hal Prince, Jerome Robbins, Stephen exactly. Sondheim. Uh, uh, oh my God. Uh, 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 who's who in the history of New York theater? So yeah. three, three, three Ashkenazi and they were like, yeah, that's why you added the, the, the Ashkenazi thing to pay a tribute. And I was not at all the case. I was like, yeah, exactly. That's what <laughs> but then, you know, it, I, I, don't th I don't think that uh, experience that you've had uh, necessarily uh, carries over everywhere. I mean, I, I have communication with a lot of people that go back and forth between New York and Israel and various other places. And there is, you know, even till today, it's, as you say, it's less today, but there is even until today, there is some level of perception uh, amongst some percentage of the Ashkenazi community that they are of a, of a little bit of a, a better pedigree than yeah. the, the Sephardic people. And the Sephardic people are kind of like the, oh, you know, oh, the those... mechanical people who were always, right. the Ashkenazi were the people, the learned people. And actually I make right. fun of it in, in the adaptation when the father of, um, of uh, of Juliet wants to marry her to a guy named Mordechai, you know. And he said, right. Mordechai, do you know how many books he has read? Why you want to go with that Romeo? Right. He, he went to public school, you know. So I say, <laughs> I, 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 I say, you know, a lot of that uh, uh, humor, of course, I brought a, a character, uh, the mother of Romeo, uh, who is typical Sephardic woman with tons of jewelry and and grabs the sun with the cheeks very <laughs> heavily and and she doesn't like the the Juliet because she's tailing away from her her son you know and she oh was, that's oh, very very oh, very you Sephardic better than me. you know, you know it's so funny Sephardic. that you bring up West Side Story because and and, and Emily uh, uh, your production. Uh, uh, and, and we're talking McCoys. about um, the Hatfields and the McCoys, 
um, there, there's a line in West Side Story, I'm a musical theater lover as well, so pardon me for quoting there as well, but, but there's one point where Lieutenant Schrank turns to them and insults all the Jets. And in doing so, he calls them a, a, a mick and a wop and all of this, and he says these horrible slang uh, slurs at them. The irony is he doesn't say Jewish. And or he doesn't say kike or anything like that. And it's interesting listening to 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 both David and Emily. You're not talking about something diverse like religion. You're talking the Hatfields and the McCoys were both uh, uh, of Christianity, if you will. And and in your case, they were both Jewish. So again, it it goes to this almost futility of of it's not a matter of saying we don't like your God. It's like well, we just don't like the way you pray. It comes down to something so small. And, and I find that so ironic in Romeo and Juliet, when you really look at it, there's so many important parts of it that, that if you really look at it with the 21st century eye, you say, really, that's the problem? That's why they're not together? And I think both your productions seem to have that going on in it. Why did you pick the Hatfields and the McCoys? So when we first started our company, the concept behind it was to, to ground Shakespeare in Americana pop culture so to bring mm. it to a, a to a we're bringing it to an american audience so how can we present it to them clearly where in a way that we'll understand as opposed to shakespeare you know elizabethan england which none of us have seen ever uh, england perhaps but not elizabethan england for sure um and so we kind of started exploring all different versions of different plays of how to to bring them to america and that one in particular, I don't, I don't remember. It was actually our artistic director at the time who was like, what if we did kind of like an Appalachian thing? And we were all like, oh, wait a minute and started going down the rabbit hole on that. And it, I think like with any production of Romeo and Juliet, you, as you just said, Jay, you don't need a huge reason for these families to be feuding. I think actually a minute one actually makes it better for the production almost because it's like like you said it makes the audience be like why why can't they just be together i think it makes romeo and juliet feel that way too right right i think that's right. what makes it so compelling and and that's what makes uh, everyone from middle school to middle age think it's so marvelous because they our prejudices and this is also where i say shakespeare's so clairvoyant our prejudices will stop us if it was Jewish versus Catholic, if it was black versus white, unfortunately, the prejudices that are drummed into us, we get to sit there and we almost subconsciously, we're going to choose a side somewhere. But it's so tiny. Uh, uh, our first production, as I mentioned, was in a trailer park. And the only difference was this is where Romeo's trailer was. This is where Juliet's trailer was. And everyone laughed because it was so Jerry Springer. But, but the point of it was exactly like you're talking about the Hatfields and the McCoys and like you're talking about Ashkenazi versus Sephardic. It's like, oh, come on. Is that it? Uh, it almost it almost brings to mind there was that that old show. What was it called? The one with Rod Serling. You would know this, Jay. Twilight you're, Zone. Twilight Zone, right, of course. How could I forget? Twilight Zone. And there was the episode where you have one set of people that are black and white with black on the left and white on the right. And the other people are black on the right and white on the left. And they're at war you're, with- You're almost, you're almost right. That is from the, star, that is from Star Trek. That That's is an Star episode Trek. of okay. Star Trek. But the Twilight Zone had many episodes where, uh, where also it's like the difference was so slight that right. again, you sat there and thought Romeo and Juliet. But yes, your point. So, I want to also, though, just say that beyond these themes, the reason we also love Romeo and Juliet really is the language and how beautiful some of the passages are. The, the expression of love, um, the, the expression of young love, the balcony scene is just the things that that coming out of the mouths, um, the um, it, that that is what is really uniting. I think that is why, besides these very universal themes, his language is just absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. And, you know, and and so to to we to to get back to that portion of it, um, I, you know, the light by you know, I'm trying to think of some of the iconic phrases and I don't want to blow the you'll be better let's, let's go right than into I Lady, am. let's go into Lady Capulet Melissa you know for you yes. you have you take some of that existing those love relationships that those that beautiful as you say that it's magnificent it's some of the most beautiful expression of love some of those the things that they say to each other it's it's it becomes a parlance for our modern day Iconic. love stories 
Iconic. It's iconic. Yes. Uh, I defy you, stars, and all that stuff. Uh, it, the so Palmer's how, Kiss. The, whole the Palmer's thing. Kiss for yes. you in in your play, Melissa. And you know, again, I won't reveal the exact nature of the love relationship, but there is that intense. Uh, there's a, a love relationship, a scandal between uh, members of different people. Yes, it it's it very much mirrors. You know, they meet at a party. And uh, Montague and Rose meet at a party and, and, and they are fall in love instantly. And so we follow their, this journey. The journey is, will they be able to be happy? Will they be able to be together? And, um, and so there's a lot of parallels there. And as we know, um, she becomes Lady Capulet. But there's a lot of uh, reasons then as to why this family is feuding. And that is what we're exploring. We're exploring why, why there's such an intense hate. And at each moment in the play, one of the characters will announce why he or she is going to have or get their revenge in some way or another, or why, you know, why they um you know hate they declare their hatred for the other yeah no. i feel like melissa really tapped into the fact that these two families are destined to love and hate each other with literally all the passion that there is like that that's what this play is about is it's passion it's either hatred or love and i think melissa just tapped right into that like it, it's cyclical, right? It doesn't end. And, and whether it's love or hate or both, because we see so much of both in, the, in this both plays, she really just captured that, I think, so beautifully. So Listen, now I, I've we're... got to ask you language in this. You're, 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 uh, yes, you're right. The language in this, like, like Rodney said, is, 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 is opera beyond opera. Um, uh, my favorite character, one of my favorite characters in it is the nurse. And the nurse is so dirty. Um, why do we have, what was the point, do you think, in this beautiful romance to have the woman that took care of Juliet be such a comical figure? Was it simply a plot device or you think Shakespeare's doing something with that? What, what, why, does, why is the nurse so dirty? Shakespeare really loved, there's always the humor, there's, the, there's always the upstairs downstairs. In, in Shakespeare. So you've got everybody, you've got the prince, you've got royalty on the top and you've got the servants and the, you know, dog bear, all different people. And the nurse is at the bottom and the nurse in Lady Capulet is the same nurse in Romeo and Juliet. Um, and, and she's funny too. Uh, in fact, you know, I, I picked up a couple of jokes there <laughs> and sort of changed them around for her, but she, yeah, she basically, um, you know, she's, she is, she's is the comic relief. Comic relief. And, yeah. and well, also, and, as you yeah, said, yeah, I, wanted, I have to, I have to talk to Jay and say, I want to challenge you and say, I actually think that until Mercutio dies, this play is a comedy. Oh, yes. you know, you're right. Oh, yes. You're right. Her whole monologue about, about Juliet falling down and, and the interpretation of her falling down, it's hilarious. The, the nipple on my dog and all, it's, it's hilarious. Melissa, you said something very interesting. Uh, uh, and, and Emily, you're right. It is a comedy on this. Uh, the nurse, and we're talking about uh, uh, class war. There's so many Shakespeare plays. Rodney, you brought this up many times with, with Macbeth, um, we, with Coriolanus, with so many others, a class war. It seems the nurse is the one that goes between them. She's yes. the one that goes all over. And, yes, and it, she, del she is the messenger, you know, she goes between Juliet and Romeo. And so they're always around, you know, they're running through the streets, delivering the messages, coming back. And in fact, when she comes back and, and, and then she, when the nurse comes back to Juliet, she kind of has a little part where she's like I'm so tired and my feet hurt and my corns and all of this kind of stuff and Juliet has to say come on oh pretty nurse and 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 you know softens oh, her a, up and then before she delivers story. the message she kind of exercises her power there for a few minutes. <laughs> is, is that a tiny hypnosis for us so that we accept and this is also why the play is so accepted why we accept Juliet who is obviously a more uh, 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 elite family and Romeo, which is not, it's like, okay, we love the nurse and she's of both. She works for the wealthy, but she is able to cross over and handle the more austere family. So is, is she almost like saying, 
it's okay. They're both good. You don't have to choose between them because of class. Because I, I think, think between her and Friar Lawrence, yes. Because I think he actually is a better interpretation of what you're talking about. He's very serious. That's that's uh, that's the reason I excluded him. Even though I played him once, uh, he he was very serious. Uh, and and the nurse is so hilarious. That's why I'm thinking is Shakespeare saying, let's give me a character. Let's give the audience a character that they're all going to love. Who goes here and who goes here, so that they both accept both worlds. And, and that's Mercutio to... too. You know, he's he's right. like a clown, and he is. As Rodney was saying, they're all related to the prince, actually, in some way. It, it is sort of a hierarchy. But Mercutio is able to go in between the families, and he's loved by everyone. And because he's funny, and he's kind of a jester, but, you know, but he's a cranky jester, jester as well. <laughs> we also have to remember what audience Shakespeare is writing these plays for and who, oh, yeah. is, who is paying money to get into the theater and see these shows. And there's that pit right in front of the stage where you have a whole big uh, rabble, f uh, mess the of the rabble, the groundlings who are there, they're, they pay their, their little bit of money and they have their ale and they're laughing and ho uh, hootering and hollering, having a great time and yelling and screaming and they, they love the body. So, you know, he, he, of course, there's the high-minded language and there's some of the, the, uh, the uh, a little bit more academic, uh, you might say, uh, aspect of it. But then there's, there's the, the good, silly, body, dirty fun in there too to keep the, that uh, element of the audience engaged as well. And, and as long as we're on the, the idea of what Shakespeare's audience was like, let's also talk about what Shakespeare's performers were like. Uh, in the day of Shakespeare, the, the female roles were played by young men or even boys. So do we, does that add a layer of gender confusion onto the play? In any of the productions that any of our esteemed panelists have done, has this been a, a source of tension for you to have uh, attention in terms of male versus female is this uh, the the love relationship between romeo and mercutio gets a little bit uh, questionable sometimes uh, whether it's uh, just platonic or if there's something more to it than that uh, there was a production that was done many years ago in new york where they stripped it down to four actors they called it r and j and all they, they had was like a cloth just a cloth and it was yes. just a, it was a little black box type space and it was it was stripped down to just four males playing the all the characters but this became a deep point of exploration for them is at some point these uh, male characters who are all, they're all male they're all playing some are younger than others but at some point it the the deep passion that's expressed in the play leads into so my whole eroticism and there's nothing wrong with that but it's just an interesting uh, entry point into some of the love relationships now uh jay i know that for you you always and we mentioned that at the top of the program you always have a fascination with the authorship question. So yes. let's look at the history of this play. As we mentioned, it was written in uh, about 1591, uh, and there is a quarto version of it, I believe, in 1596 or thereabouts, and it later appears in the folios. So do you have any questions that you want to pose to us before we were, we're about at that time where we're going to start to be uh, at our final moments in about five minutes or so? So before we do that, is, is there any question that you want to raise for the authorship question. I asked the big question. It was uh, our, our last group of, of guests attempted to answer it. And while I thought their answers were very impressive, I'm, I'm, I'm the kook, so this stays with me. Um, ben Johnson, Christopher Marlowe, Thomas Kidd, all of these amazing authors wrote their plays. They left a ton of plays behind. And there's usually one version of all their plays. William Shakespeare, you know, the one, uh, the, the upstart crow adorned with others' feathers. There seems to be a bad quarto of Hamlet and a good uh, folio edition. Now there seems to be two or three Romeo and Juliets, and one is in the quarto edition, one is in the folio edition, and, and okay, copyright didn't exist. But so I'm asking you all, and you all reimagined it, so, so I guess you have that license in you already. Um, if you were an author, and I suddenly said, I'm going to do Romeo and Juliet, and uh, one is Sephardic and one is Ashkenazi. David, would you say, hey, wait a minute, that's mine? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, you know, what I believe is that, and, and it confirms me every time I hear passionate people such as yourself, such as all of you guys today, is really that Shakespeare is a canvas 
on which everyone can paint their own vision. You know, Shakespeare mm. is a platform and, and really a canvas that we can paint. So, you know, it's like art. It can be like Pollock, you know, or it can be like uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. It can be, you know, everybody can do the way they want it to be. And that's the beauty of uh, Shakespeare. Completely correct. But if I said, look at this wonderful picture, it's called Starry Night by J. Michaels. I think everyone would be a little upset with me. <laughs> uh, why don't we have any- I'll buy it, I buy it from you. <laughs> and I'll sell it to you cheap, don't worry. Uh, but uh, why isn't there any record of author William Shakespeare saying, wait a minute, this is the actual version. Stop putting my name on a Yorkshire tragedy or Cardinio or two noble kinsmen, those aren't mine. Why are there allowed to be Two well, Hamlets, believe... two Romeo and Juliet. Well, there was there was no copyright back then. Copyright hadn't uh, come into society yet. And but if it he was, was just one person, very... if he, he was, was, was one just... person, wouldn't he somewhere say, "Stop! Don't take my name. Give me my I money." Think, I think Shakespeare was definitely someone of the theater, someone who knew that, by example, in Hamlet, that. Um, you know, after the sword fight, he puts something else because he knows that the actors need to rest after the sword fight. It's somewhat a new theater. However, what there's a lot of similarities with the life of uh, Edouard de Vere, who I think is the, the, maybe the real Shakespeare. And I think Marlowe was also uh, part of it um, because, you know, he went to Verona, he went to, um, Padua, he went to, to uh, Venice, and I researched a lot the merchant of Venice, and it happens that actually Edouard de Vere invested into, uh, with a guy named Michael Locke in, in Venice, and this wife comes Shylock, and uh, 3,000 ducats in the Narcosi and everything, so there are mm. things that unfortunately we might never be able to, to prove, but um, it's, there is that movie that I recommend, uh, which I'm sure Jay, you watch is- Anonymous. Anonymous, I demand my Shakespeare classes at university watch it and write a paper yeah. on it. So I, I really believe that uh, you need it to be more than just um, like a, a theater owner, a theater director, whatever Shakespeare would call himself, troop actors, chief, uh, you know, he, he was more than, he was a good CEO, I think. He was a good businessman. And this is why after the death of Edouard de Vere, he never did any play. He opened, opened the hmm. theater business or something like that. So wow. I believe Jay. it's someone who, who studied, and especially in those days, like you, you had to come from the high, very high society to have such a, a handle of the, of the language. So, you know, we'll never be able to know, but I think it's a mix of, I think it's Edouard de Vere who really wrote the play, but Shakespeare, the William Shakespeare, the guy of the theater, you know, put it more uh, theatrical because he adapted it a little bit like we all do, you know. Um, mm. That's what uh, David, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the show right now, <laughs> just so you don't take my job. <laughs> You're very Rodney will never speak to you again, but you are in Ashkenazi, we say a mensch. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, man. From, from your mouth to Shakespeare's ears. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Melissa and Emily, anyone have any uh, contributions before we uh, do the sign off? Uh, if you just allow us to plug Lady Capulet will be in March, March 25th through the uh, 30th. Um, just l look up Lady Capulet and we'll be, we'll, we'll be streaming. Uh, absolutely. So all right, let, let, let's all uh, say our fellow. Thank you all. It's been a fascinating discussion. And, and I feel like we really, uh, we, we had a long list of things we wanted to talk about tonight, but we were having so much fun with all the, the things that we did speak about that we didn't get to all of them. Maybe that'll be a, a sequel that we have to get to uh, yeah. have some other day in time. Uh, but I thank you all. Thank you, Jay, for, uh, as always, being the originator of this series and for carrying it into the future. It's, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of. Uh, thank you. And, D and Jay, you have uh, a lot of exciting things coming up. They, I think you just uh, signed on to uh, direct something via Zoom, and uh, that, I think that's going to be a lot of exciting uh, stuff coming from you. I will be directing a doll's house. I may have another show at the Signature Theater later on once doors open. A lot of projects. Very exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. Very exciting. And, and of course, uh, there'll be Shakespeare in the Park with, with Barefoot Shakespeare. In the <laughs> yeah. Shakespeare, in the park. Yeah. Shakespeare. That's right. 
we're hoping, we're hoping, we're keeping our fingers crossed that that'll be back for you. If not this year, definitely next year. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> Just keep people from tree to tree. Just keep them from tree to tree. You're in great shape. Uh, so right. just quickly before we, we, we're just about at time. Uh, David, how can people find you if they want to check out all the wonderful stuff you're Absolutely. up to? Absolutely. Well, uh, you can find me uh, on social media and David Cerrero on Instagram, on Facebook, anywhere you want. You can Google me, check my YouTube page. And uh, yeah, the next check is your adaptation. DavidCerrero.com, right? Yes, DavidCerrero.com, absolutely. And the next... Uh, Shakespeare adaptation uh, we do would be a Jewish version of Hamlet, uh, and it would be called Heimlet. <laughs> Please Heimlet. keep in touch with me and let me know. Hamlet is my absolute favorite play in the world, and a Jewish version. I could just Jewish see Polonius. I don't go out with it. Version. I go out. It's gonna rock. Ah, Emily, it's Emily, gonna where amazing. can people find you and the Barefoot Shakespeare Company? Sure. So we're at barefootshakespeare.org, or you can find us on Facebook at Barefoot Shakespeare or on Instagram and Twitter at Barefoot Shakes. And Melissa? The Melissa Bell.com. And I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Of course. All right. And I'm at uh, New York Shakespeare. That's NY Shakespeare on uh, Instagram. And I'm sorry, on uh Facebook and on Twitter and New York Shakespeare spelled out on Instagram. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And we hope to see you next time where Jay will be delving even deeper into the world of the Apocrypha. And that's a discussion that I'm sure you'll be drafting David on and firing me. For. Oh my gosh, I'm calling him right after we get offline. And thank you, Rodney, for everything, for bringing Shakespeare to everybody and for allowing a lot of independent companies such as ours, I believe, to get some uh, light and to dig into such important uh, discussions. So thank you, Rodney, for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. It's a big thank honor. You. Like it's, I say, if you do my in New York, then you do New, New York Shakespeare. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you all. Have a wonderful thank night. You, Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's thank Day. You. Same to all Take of you. Take care. Bye-bye. Ciao.